introduction, George, and good morning. Uh, as my title suggests, I'm going to look at volatility in uh, VGI and looking specifically at the example of, of OpenStreetMap. And I suppose to start off with something humorous, uh, you wouldn't buy a second-hand car without knowing its history. You wouldn't buy a new car without knowing its history. And as we see in the uh, text here, that uh, just looking from the outside may not always give you a clue to how good the product is. So I suppose to summarize what my presentation will be is to, is to look at the history of objects in OpenStreetMap and see if we can understand something about user contribution, about how the shapes evolve, and are there patterns of contribution and shape changes and evolution that are revealed in the history. So I suppose this is part of a series of work that we're undertaking at my university to look at development of quality indicators for OpenStreetMap. Now, Mookie gave some excellent examples in his presentation of places where OpenStreetMap has been compared to authoritative sources. What we feel is a really good research topic is to look at OpenStreetMap in isolation. It is so unique, it is so different, so dynamic, that there is an opportunity there to look at it and see if there's inherent quality indicators actually in the data. So we'll begin. And something that I, I say to the GIS community, I work with the Environmental Protection Agency back home, so I, I meet the GIS community in Ireland in a couple of different ways. I'm part of it. I meet it in terms of a, a government official and then as a, an open street map person. And uh, one of the greatest works in the English language begin, begun its life as a volunteer project. People were asked to go out there and collect reports of words and phrases, regardless of how rare or obsolete they were. And so that brings us then straight to OpenStreetMap. I was on a research trip to uh, Peking University last week, and there's great excitement in China about a new bridge in uh, Chengdu, which has just opened. And to follow George's lead, it's just long enough for a marathon to run across this. The key thing is, uh, it's, it's not available in the, in the other sources of uh, map tiles. So this thing has been four years in, uh, in building. It's 26 miles long. It's not too easy to miss out. Uh, so, uh, but it's nice, again, following from the South Sudan example yesterday, it's nice to see uh, OpenStreetMap so up to date and capturing that dynamic nature of, of uh, society. You'll have seen one of those slides in uh, Mucky's talk just a few moments ago. The other work from Heidelberg, again, is showing how accurate street networks are and road networks in general from OpenStreetMap are against authoritative sources. However, this is where my work comes in, that a lot of this, this analysis is normally done on the current snapshot, so the current downloadable snapshot of the global OpenStreetMap data. So what about the history? And how did the object you're looking at actually evolve to its current state? Now, unfortunately, accessing history in, in OpenStreetMap is not very easy. It's not a simple case of just making an API call. And you really need a few things. You need some time on your hands. You need some processing power and no shortage of inspiration or stubbornness in, in some ways. Now, you could download the full Planet OSM history, but as we'll see in a minute, that, that's quite a task in itself. So what I've chosen to do is to, is to look at a specific subset of, of OpenStreetMap. Some of the work in, in Wikipedia quality looks at the featured articles. Rather than looking at every article in Wikipedia, let's look at the featured ones. So how about high edit features? So those have about 15 or more versions uh, of edits. So Martin, who I'm not sure is here at the conference, the previous presentation, basically the full history dump is a massive, massive, massive file. Has everything in there, but getting things out of it is quite awkward. Uh, Frederick Ram has the, the history coverage service which allows to build animated GIFs of how history is changing in di different places. The history browser then is a lovely little tool which shows you some ideas of comparing previous versions, again in, in a kind of a text format, with hyperlinks to, uh, to various uh, web services. And the, the change set viewer, the only problem with the change set viewer is you really have to know what a change set is uh, to, to really get value out of this. But again, it's another way to explore the history of, of objects. Uh, at Munster, then, a really nice little application looking at making heat maps of activity. Again, for the potential 
of looking at how these things are changing. Now, just at the moment, it's only looking at uh, nodes. And at Heidelberg, again, and there'll be a presentation by the first author here and the second this afternoon, just looking again at, at how we can figure out the different types of coverages uh, that OpenStreetMap offers. And then looking again from Wikipedia, visualizations are beginning to appear. It's not easy to do, but there are appear they are appearing for, for Wikipedia. And no academic talk wouldn't be, would be complete without some slide with uh, some literature on it. Essentially, collaborative projects are gaining a lot of interest in, in the academic community across many domains. And some authors are looking at how do you encourage collabor uh, contributors to these projects? Uh, how do you ensure that the problem of liking the idea that Joe Bloggs can contribute, but not liking the idea of Joe Bloggs himself actually contributing? And I like the, the idea of the 90%, 9-1% idea that this 1% is constantly contributing. I think our results show that, and, and other results as well. And the last slide, the last item on the slide is actually from a completely different domain. It's looking, collecting macroinvertebrate samples. Uh, in the UK, and the, the results from that looked at that the number of hours training, the number of in-task support lessons given, the education, the profession, didn't actually predict the data quality of uh, the samples returned. Now it's a different area, but it's a pretty specialist area as well. So some analysis. So uh, there's a few different aspects of this analysis here. Firstly, we looked into uh, planet.osm and uh, Paul Kelly from Queen's University Belfast wrote a really nice piece of C code to pick out uh, uh, basically any kind of uh, version number we were looking for. So there's where the top 1,000 most edited uh, features are on, on OpenStreetMap and the, the lower, uh, the minimum version is 73. So Europe obviously has, has quite a high uh, percentage of, of those. Germany then, when we uh, look inside, has the most high edit features out of the top 1,000. Just to look at a couple of simple examples there, uh, a really nice place to do some mapping in Honolulu, the northwest tip of the island there is a, a track road which has been edited 82 times. Uh, Central Africa, not really sure why a very simple street would have received so many edits, uh, but uh, an interesting example. And then in Fiji, uh, quite ha heavily edited, but unfortunately the, this uh, feature is, is, is a bit crazy. It's neither a polygon nor a line, and it's, uh, I'm not sure, it's, it's not quite sure what it is. And uh, right up in a really difficult part of the world to map in uh, at the Beren Sea there, another quite uh, heavily edited feature. So what do these top 1,000 actually look like? Well, for the most part, uh, they actually don't have lots of nodes. And for the most part, there, there's, no super, there's some super versioning, but for the most part, they're clustered around uh, about the 70 to 100 mark. So just to put that in context then, who are the world champions? Uh, the world champions are in Japan at the moment, and Lausanne in Switzerland is coming in third. But if we look at those closely, we begin to see that this, the champion has three editors, but one editor was exclusively responsible for pretty much the entire thing. So there's 10 chain sets. So this guy was working pretty hard uh, when he was uh, doing the editing. The triangle here is the number of nodes starting off, the maximum, and then what it's ended with. The silver medalist then is one editor. So seven chain sets. So a chain set, for those who are not familiar, can be open for 24 hours. So maximum this guy spent there, I think, if my calculations are correct, would be a week's work. Again, the triangle then is similar in terms of its peak, but uh, obviously the feature is much longer. Now, what I'm saying about the third one is it's a really good example, and maybe it should be the gold medalist, in that there's 37 editors uh, to this feature. Now, looking into the history of this, this has been part of uh, Lake Geneva, and there's been a lot of breaking of the polygon and a bit of switching around. One editor did uh, create half of the versions there's a lot of change sets, so there's a lot of work going on. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, feature. Now, what I'm going to do is just show some examples of evolution of features to show the interesting things that can, can uh, be seen if we look back into the history. So if we look at a, a, 
a land use, a forest polygon from uh, Luxembourg created in 2008. You'll notice down here it's not closed, so it's, it's not quite right, but two minutes later that's sorted out. Now, if we look about 12 days later, we have two users. The shape has changed already. We still have this unfortunate crossover up here. Again, two users, nine minutes later, they've not fixed this, but they've put this arm here, and we're growing again. Three users, seven months later, another year and a half, so we're nearly up to date now, and it's current version. So I'm going to show you that one again now in a few moments, but the second example then, uh, in Austria. Now, what I want you to keep your eye on is the, the tags here. That uh, This tag just seems to hang around endlessly. Now, the problem here is we have a self-intersection. If we were to actually zoom in there, we have another self-intersection appearing up here. This comment about doing the sketch using Landsat is still there. And we have a valid geometry now. <coughs> The next sequence then, again, and then what happens down here is all the tiles are deleted. So, and the current version actually is a broken polygon or a broken something. The third example then, just to finish this off, is a nice example from Dusseldorf, the River Rhine. Uh, 2007 was the creation date. We have a, a problem here of self-intersection. It's still there up to the middle of May but it's been fixed now and uh, it's, it's all sorted. So if you want to take down the second link there, uh, I have about 30 examples on my, my homepage of these animated GIFs. If you really have three or four minutes to spare per animated GIF, uh, please feel free to look. I'll just show you what one of these guys looks like. Uh, so the this is the example from Luxembourg again. So this will give you an idea of, on a version-by-version -version basis, how these things are growing. Now what I intend to do over the next few weeks is to uh, pretty this up a bit and give some more information at the bottom there to allow you to see how many users and also color in actually where the activity is happening. Sometimes it's quite difficult to see exactly where uh, action is happening on a particular polygon. So that's the page there. Of a, a few different examples, uh, feel free to use them uh, as you need see fit. So just to look at some uh, way that attributes can change. I really like these two examples from uh, England and Scotland. I think someone's trying a regular expression here to see if they're getting it to work. Uh, eventually we settle down on what probably should be the, the correct name. But there's an issue there with incorrect spelling, shortening of the, the names. Now, again, to the man on the street, if you wrote down Phoenix Crescent spelled incorrectly, they would understand where it is. But again, to uh, you know, matching these names in, in terms of a, a search query uh, will lead to some problems. Uh, highway tag in, in the USA, there's nothing actually wrong with this. It's just that there's a lot of additional things here and then we've, we settle on the Will Rogers e Expressway. Uh, Bordeaux, France, some problems here are, again, within the cha same change set, they're, they're sorted out. This is my own formatting, that's my problem, and we can see we settle on the, and I think the th thing is we need to look, actually check with on the ground mappers to understand what these changes are. We can't just say they're, they're bad news because they, they come up in our, our results. Another two examples from the US, uh, strange that Internet, Interstate 25 would then not have a name anymore. Uh, again, to, s to look at the mappers at a local level and see what's happened here. Is this just a mistake using the editor that's accidentally deleted the, the tag? And land use, uh, I think the, the land use attribute issue brings some really nice uh, problems in terms of semantics uh, to the fore. And my uh, ability in semantics is not very very strong, but I think an interesting thing here is that can a wood be a forest at the same time? Then if it was a wood, why is it not a wood anymore? And then it becomes a meadow. So has there been some deforestation all of a sudden? And I like this example here where someone's corrected themselves very, very quickly within the same change set. Suddenly there was a landfill 
appeared here and uh, then suddenly uh, it was uh, removed. And a very strange example, I checked this this morning, so it's still up there. It's uh, a meadow that you can swim in. So uh, that's a rendering. I'm not sure what's happening there. there I, I, I should check the other tags, but the land use key is, uh, is meadow. So just to summarize that analysis, basically we've looked at the UK <coughs> and Ireland, uh, Germany and Austria, about 10,000 objects in, uh, in the UK. So we've got a uh, quarter of a million edits which we've looked at. Uh, in Germany, I, I've just finished, well, I've just almost finished the second analysis of Germany where we've looked at almost 67,000 features. I don't have results for that quite ready yet. Again, we've about 10,000 features there. Uh, the Austrian example was about 3,000 uh, features. Where did they come from in Germany, for example? Well, high edit features are scattered all over the place and in different, uh, different locations. Now this again comes to the example of the 90%, 9 and 1%, the contributor effort. So this is just number of edits. So we can see that a huge amount of people do five or less edits, and then not so many people do the, the big number of editing. So if we look at the, just one edit from our subset, and there's remarkable consist consistency across the, the data sets, that it's about 30% of people just do one edit within that subset. And even low volume edits, just 10 or less. Something that interested me, uh, and I have changed set examples after this, is that this is probably the result of uh, consecutive versions. This is probably people just being cautious and saving their work, which is probably a good idea. But then there's the opposite end of this is that most edits actually take place within a month of each other, so there's quite a long time span there. There is the misconception in maybe G the GIS community that VGI is, is uh, changing so quickly, there's just simply no way we can keep up with it. So certainly a month gives people time to uh, keep up with these things. Uh, looking at the change sets, the top uh, change sets in the Eng England data set has 127 ways in it, so that has a lot of edits inside it. I have the star beside this, there's 267 ways, all performed by this user. If, you're, if you are that user, uh, identify yourself to me, I'd like to meet you and have a chat. Is it a bot? I'm not sure. The same example for the very large Germany set. I'm not sure whether someone can edit 2,000 ways in 24 hours. Uh, again, I, I'd like to talk to people about that. Again, the change set example, if you've just been involved in one change set, the statistics seem to be consistent for just being involved with one edit. And then for more than 100 change sets, we're seeing here that it starts to get pretty small percentages of people who are involved in really high frequency editing. Uh, tag flip-flopping is what I like to say in terms of highways, for example, uh, that are changing their designation as users enter the project. Now, this is a bit of blurry because there's actually no correlation between more users entering the editing of a way and the number of changes. We actually have an example in Germany where there's a tag war over a particular highway and there's been 27 different changes of designation happening. So just to finish off some future work and, and outlook, I want to try and formalize the, the change description that I've just shown you and the detection model we've outlined. Uh, there's some journal papers in the, in the pipeline. I'd like to, if I can get the time or, or uh, get a master student to, to help me with it, to make this a web application for selected areas so people can actually click and uh, play around with these things. To apply the Wikipedia quality models, some very strong ones have been developed. Can we change the idea of a Wikipedia page to a spatial object? And then, of course, collaborate with the community so I can understand these results a bit better from people who are actually doing the editing. Ideally, the work is looking towards a stability metric. And I've used the Richter scale as an example. Like, can we get something simple, a between 0 and 10 index, which somehow functionally combines oops, excuse me, all of these things into giving some idea of how stable an object or a group of objects are? And I'm going to finish off with a, a smiley face. Uh, OSM data is volatile, but again, the history of the data is volatile. We need some kind of an API. OSM is different, so the quality assessment 
an understanding of it would have to be different as well. As Muckley has said in his, his talk, geometric accuracy is, is pretty well tackled in the GIS community and land cover and polygons are not so well covered at the moment. Who is to blame uh, for some of the problems we've seen here? Is it the editors themselves or the software? And Patrick's talk yesterday may have shown maybe some inexperienced editors would have problems with the software. Our research supports Pascal Nielsen's idea that 35% of people go and edit something and then the Nielsen idea as well. And I wonder, again, is there enough work to maintain and retain these mega contributors in the project, the people who are doing crazy amounts of editing? What happens when they get a little bit tired or their area is mapped? Can we retain them in the project and at least retain that, that knowledge? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, I would like to allow only one urgent question only, if uh, needed, because we're running out of time and the coffee break is already very close to us, so we can have a discussion with Peter in the coffee break as well. Is there an urgent question? If this is not the case, please have a seat. We switch